Uh, despite stock. the negative start to 2024, an investor known for the big short questions whether we are still too bullish. Steve Eisman is senior portfolio manager at Newberger Berman. Steve, welcome to the show. Happy New Year to you. Thank you. I'm honored to be here on your first show. <laughs> um, so you think that market fundamentals are actually good, but overall sentiment is too bullish? How do you distinguish? Well, I mean, think of it this way. Let's say we were here a year ago. Mm -hmm. uh, most of your guests would have come in and said the earnings of the S&P are going to be down. The market's going to be down. The economy is going to go into a recession in about 15 seconds. And none of that happened. Um, the recession that never was. And so the market climbed the wall of worry the whole year. So now here we are a year later. And everybody is, including me, is, has a pretty benign view of the economy. The only thing that bothers me is just that I don't think we're necessarily wrong on the economy. I think we're probably right. It's just everybody's coming to the year so bullish that if there are any disappointments, you know, what's going to hold the market up? But I, I think long term, I'm still very bullish. But near term, I just worry that everybody's coming to the year, you know, feeling too good. We're having a whole conversation about about Apple uh, and how the markets might need to discriminate, you know, in within big cap technology. How do you feel about the backdrop of the economy with the Magnificent Seven? Is it time for rotation? Is it is this the backdrop to rotate into lower P.E. stocks or does that not matter to you? I, I don't focus on that yeah. that much. Um, I still think, you know, the Magnificent, you have to have at least a significant percentage of your assets in the Magnificent, magnificent Seven. There are the themes that we also really talk to our investors about like infrastructure 1.2 trillion is still going to get spent in the United States over the next 10 years first time we've had a industrial policy in the United States of America probably since anybody in this room has been alive so that's a big theme so I look I think there are a lot of good things going forward in the market just you know just start the year psychologically everybody is just a little a little too freaking happy well so a place where you haven't been terribly happy, and we want to hear most investors. When you talk about banks, people want to listen. You've you've got a, a note of my story history. Yeah. Well, you, you you've made some great calls, some oh, very successful calls on on the banking sector. And, and I think probably three months ago, you said somewhere, you know, in the context of probably a much bigger conversation, but that banks were were not investable. And I think if we're going to get the market to rally further from here, we need the participation of banks. So just touch base on banks at the start of this year. So I mean, let's take let's pick on one bank. I mean, and I have no position in this bank and I have nothing against the company. It's like Bank of America. So Bank of America is a very well-run bank. It's got a very good CEO. That doesn't mean they haven't made mistakes. They bought a hell of a lot of long-term bonds at the wrong point in the cycle. Uh, it's not a balance sheet problem. It's more of an earnings problem. So the earnings, if you look, are basically flattish for the last few years, up and down by just a little bit percentage. So what's, what, how are you going to make money in Bank of America? You're going to need really two things. You're going to need the Fed to cut rates, so that'll help people's perception of the balance sheet. Um, and you need no recession, so benign credit. Now, could that happen? Sure. But I'm actually of the view, you know, the market seems to think the Fed's going to cut rates at least three times this year. I, at this point, don't have that view. I think the Fed is still petrified of making the mistake that Volcker made in the early 80s where he stopped raising rates and inflation got out of control again. So I'm not that bullish on the Fed cutting rates. And if that's correct, I think it's going to be hard to make money in the major money center banks. Now, that's not that's not a company specific call. That's a real macro -y call. You know, it's hard to you know, make a long-term investment case for the banks when you have to deal with so many macro factors like that. Steve, as we sit here, U.S. debt 34, just went over 34 trillion today. Is there a scenario where there's a debt concern, debt problem in 2024, some sort of credit crisis that you're looking at? 100% no. 100% no? No. Um, you know, in our business, we like to say being too early is the equivalent of being wrong. And there have been plenty of times in my career where I've been too early. But I'm not 40 years too early. And, you know, the people who are making this argument about U.S. debt have been literally been making this argument for the last 30 to 40 years. And they're still making it. Mm -hmm. And they're telling you to buy Bitcoin because of it. And, you know, my attitude is when you're 40 years too early, have a little freaking humility and <laughs> keep your mouth shut. Mm -hmm. So... There's absolutely no evidence whatsoever that the dollar is going to lose its reserve currency status. Um, 
people still want to buy U.S. debt. They're not, they're not replacing it with Chinese debt. So, you know, until there's a real problem in the U.S. bond market, I think we're just fine. Hey, speaking of humility, Guy, as the kids would say, he's got a good fit. Like, well, I was gonna, what's going on well, can we, before we even, yeah. the last time Steve was on, I commented on yeah. his stylist. Yeah. Yeah. But you've taken it up and, like, Well, you know, you put so much pressure on me. <laughs> I got another new jacket. Yeah. It looks yeah. great. A little pocket square. Yeah. Like, yeah. And, I have, and I have a whole, you know, this is all part of my New Year's resolution. That's yeah. working. Which is uh, think Yiddish, dress British. Yeah, oh, there you go. All right, there you go. All right, but Steve, <laughs> so you manage portfolios. And again, we love to focus so on the things that a lot of our viewers know you to, to be great at, right? Yeah. But when you think about it, you more portfolios across lots of different industries, right? And you think about what generative AI did to the stock market this year, right? Yes. And that's really what infected the Magnificent Seven and really buoyed the stock market in a year where you just mentioned earnings. They didn't grow much this year. They were up less than 1%, right? You're over right, but, but, but the expectation was they were going to be down 10 to 15. Correct. All right, but next year the expectation is that they're going to be up 10 to 11%. Correct. So my question to you now is that the stock market has realized a lot of the enthusiasm about this technology. Again, being 40 years early, this is going to be something that dominates for decades. What do you expect it to do in 2024 for actual earnings, not just in the Magnificent Seven, but across other industries? I you know, other than NVIDIA and maybe AMD and, you know, maybe some Microsoft, I don't think you're going to see that much of an impact on earnings in tech yet. It's going to be, it's still going to be very story driven. You know, what I'm most curious about is other than the very, very large tech companies, nobody really yet has a real AI story to tell. And the question is, is anybody going to emerge? And it's only day one of the year. So... I mean, the best part of it being day one of the year is I haven't made many, any mistakes yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you had mentioned that you don't think the Fed's going to cut rates. but most I didn't say that. I said I, I, I think the expectation that the Fed will cut rates three times, at, I, I, from where I'm sitting, I think is wrong. Okay. Or is too aggressive so what is, at this point. What is right in your view? Because mm -hmm. the market believes that there's going to be probably two, at least two and maybe three at this point. I think the best, if you had to lay your life on the line, I'd say one. One. Unless there's a recession. If there's no recession, I don't see any reason why the Fed needs to be aggressive at cutting rates. That before. seems like a, you know, a dichotomy versus what is it within market consensus. And so that leads me to the question of what we've seen rallies in the end of the year as that consensus has taken hold. that right. The Fed will cut rates about three times. Things have rallied. And I'm thinking, you know, if solar, for instance, that depends on funding, other sectors that depend on funding. Have massive, had massive rallies. Yeah. I think that's that's probably not right, at least not at but, this point. But Steve, you must not think inflation is going to come in much then, because if the Fed is only going to cut once, right, like that. Well, I, I think it's, I think even if inflation does come in, if I'm the Fed and I'm, I'm looking at the Volcker lesson, I say to myself, what's my rush? Inflation has come in. If I don't, if I don't, if I'm not aggressive, at cutting, I can always cut rates tomorrow if things get weak. But if the economy is still flying and inflation has come in, why don't I keep rates here? I mean, look, nobody calls me to consult. <laughs> I'm just giving you a buy a they, they call you to say, what should we wear today? Yes, they don't yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Okay. But um, so if I'm, I'm in Powell's seat, I'm, I pat myself on the back and say, job well done. And the risk, my real risk is that I cut rates and inflation resurges. And then I have a real problem. If if I don't cut rates, or if I, I maybe only cut once, and I just sit there and wait, I can wait. I'll see how the data goes. That, that's what I would do if I were in their shoes. You know, what they'll do, who knows. You mentioned the, rent, the run, for instance, in solar. Housing has had a huge run as well. That's also... So I, I would say housing stocks are justified. I'd say residential solar stocks are not justified. You know, the housing stocks are justified in the sense that the home builders have great balance sheets, they're able to buy down rates to their customers so that the customers can afford to buy new homes. And there's a shortage of new homes. You know, residential solar at this point, I think, is still going to have a down year. Um, how down, I don't know. But it, I, I, I haven't seen a data point yet in residential solar that would make me be positive. I'd like to see one, but I haven't seen one yet. What about the, again, in a world where the market does have rotation and we talked about the vulnerability of either multiples and high multiple type, but the sectors that include healthcare, energy, staples. Um, and look, let's be clear, utilities and staples got hammered uh, a good part of last year. I mean, that, 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 that seems interesting. I'm, you know, utilities, I think, had just a horrendous year last year. And it wasn't, there, was, there really no fundamental issue. It was a pure rate Rates. play. So, you look, if you have a benign rate environment, I'd probably, probably rather own 
uh, utilities than most staples at this point. 